morning, Connect Church family and friends. What a joy it is to be able to, to touch base and be together through this platform, whether it's the radio or Facebook Live or YouTube, to, to worship and stand in awe of the greatness of Jesus. And so I just want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for, for being present. So I, I hope you've grabbed your coffee. I hope you're settled in and you're ready to, to worship with us together as a community. And before I, we kick off this service, just a quick note. Uh, we are a community. We are a community, Connect Churches, that wants to connect people to Jesus. And so we're excited to be able to have this opportunity through these platforms to be able to connect you, connect ourselves to Jesus and all his greatness. And since we're a community and there's social distancing right now, uh, just want to be able to still build community during this time. And so I don't know if you've ever noticed before, on the Facebook Live, on YouTube, there's a a link to a document. It's It's a prayer form. And you have the opportunity to fill that out, and it will be submitted to the leadership of this church, and we would love to be able to pray with you and for you. And so uh, just loop into the community that way. That's one simple way that we would love for you to just to share specific prayer requests, whether it's about yourself or family or just situation. And please know that we'll be praying for you during this time as a community that wants to connect you to Jesus. And so as we, we think about Jesus, as we get ready to stand in awe of him, I want to turn to a Bible passage to kick us off. And I've been tapping into Bible passages at the start of our worship that refer to home and house. And I got one more for you, Joshua 24. Joshua says this to his leaders, to his people. Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I wanted to read that at the start because this is what it's speaking of. It's speaking of clarity. Joshua is very clear on who he serves. And it's the Lord. It's only him. And he's committed. This is what we're going to do. And so in this day, I'm asking at the start of this worship service, get your hearts, get your mind focused with clarity on who you choose to serve today and the next day. And let's make a commitment today in worship to do that. And so will you join me in prayer? Gracious God and Father, as we are gathered throughout this city, throughout this state, throughout this country, maybe throughout this world, Lord, I ask that your spirit makes himself known to each of us in clear and powerful ways. Lord, we can host a service, we can put together a service, we could speak, we could sing, we could pray, but none of this means anything apart from the work you can do by your spirit. And so Lord, move among us so that in this day we have clarity on who is worthy of all our praise, who we long to serve. Give us a heart's desire for Jesus. And Lord, I pray that in this day, we make a commitment to him. He is our Lord. He is our life. He is our joy. And today, we serve him, me and my house. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, pray. Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. 
just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood jesus jesus how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust him Trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, pray. So in the first verse of the next song, we'll be singing King of My Heart. It says, let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. And a lot of times we think when we're in a shadow, when um, we're in a dark place, that might mean that evil's there, that God is distant from us, but that's totally untrue. God is there and he might be closer to us than we could ever imagine. In Psalm 91, it says that God will cover us with his feathers and we will um, take, and under his wings, we will find refuge. And so think about that. When we think that we're in a really dark time, that there's, the end is not in sight, that we don't know what will even happen in the next few seconds. Or we think that hope is all gone. God's there. And he is so close to us that all we can, that all we can see and all that we're surrounded by is his peace and his presence. So know that when we hide in his shadow, it is not a place of evil, but it's a place of refuge and rest. The echo of my days, 
words sing over you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my this is how I fight. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you this is how we fight our battles this is how we fight our battles this is how we fight our battles this is how this is how we fight our battles this is how we fight our battles this is how we fight our battles this is how night is holding on when the night is holding on to me God is holding on he's holding when the night is holding on to me God is 
So at this time, we'll have um, some of the kids from our church share with us Psalm 23. And we just pray that you're blessed by this, that as they read this, them in their youth, that we also run to the Father like children. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the tables before me of my presence and my enemy. You anoint my head. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good morning, Connect Church family. I'd like you to join me in prayer at this time. Uh, Wherever two or three are gathered together, there is God in the midst of them, and we're, we're gathered. Um, in different ways on this Sunday morning, but I pray that you would pray with me. Dear God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercies. We, we thank you for beautiful weather. We thank you for the spring. We see the farmers going to the fields and planting crops. We pray for safety for them. We, we thank you for trees budding and birds singing we thank you, Lord, even for um, <clears throat> the trials that we go through. We, we know that you put a joy into us that uh, cannot be squelched by the conditions of this world. We thank you, Lord, for knowing, giving us the knowledge that you are in control even when we are uh, maybe disrupted in our lives, maybe confused and anxious. But, uh, but you are none of those things, Lord. You're far above that. You are uh, having your good purposes in, in all of this and in each of our lives. Help us to, to focus on you, to see what it is you're doing in our lives in this uh, unique time in our history. We pray, Lord, that you'd give us faith and trust in you. Uh, we pray, Lord, too, for members of our Connect Church family that are struggling with other things. Sometimes uh, there are health issues, and we we know people have trouble with uh, their back, trouble with their eyes, trouble with um, different elements of physical things, and some are recovering from big surgeries, and we pray, Lord, that you just would be with all those people, keep each one in your care. Other folks are um, confined Uh, Right now, Lord, so many of us feel confined to where we are, but there are members that we have that are just week after week and month after month and even year after year are are confined to a place that they can't gather with us here either, even if the pandemic is over. We pray for those people that you just keep each one in your care and keep them encouraged, help us to, to be kind to them and help them to know that we love them. We pray for our our city leaders, Lord, for our county and state and national leaders and just for the world, Lord, pray that good decisions can be made and we could get past this trouble that's been raised by the virus. We pray that you would help us to just focus on you and know that while some of these problems seem really big, Lord, really the big problem we have is with sin, with uh, what sin leads to is, is death, that we die and then what sin and death lead to is a a time of judgment where we would be judged for coming short so far from what you desire for us. And we just thank you, Lord, for the good news, for the good news that you have conquered sin in our lives. You've conquered death. You've conquered judgment so that even though we see that sin in our lives, we know, Lord, that you can forgive it all. 
we, uh, we pray for your help in turning away from that sin. But we know, Lord, that it's not up to us to measure up, but it's up to us to put our trust in you. And we thank you for that good news. We pray that you'd help every member of this audience, every member of the Connect Church, every member of your church, Lord. We pray, Lord, you help us to just share that good news with people who need to hear it. There are many, Lord, who don't understand and just feel that state of confusion and perplexion. We pray that you just help us to share the good news. And um, we thank you that we have that good news, Lord. We thank you for your goodness to us. Pray that you would bless us in the rest of this day. And may the week ahead be good for everyone listening here. We pray this as we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you took that time to grab your Bibles and to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Today we're going to walk through verses 1 through 13 together in this sermon series that we've entitled Social Distancing Discipleship. And the reason we're doing that is in this letter, Paul and Timothy are socially distanced because Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. And during this time, we are socially distanced. And so what this is about is how are we to be disciples and discipled during this time of social distancing? And Paul taps into that. And so we're going we're gonna to dive into chapter 2 to, to see what that looks like. Before we do, let, let me set it up this way. So this is a truth I want us to be thinking about today. New situations can be hard to know how to handle. Truth? You guys agree with that? That it can be hard to know how to handle new situations. Right now, we are in a new situation. We are in a COVID-19 situation. We are in a situation that no one has ever experienced to this extent before in the generation. This generation that we remember. And so how do we handle it? It's hard to know. Because the this, this situation is so fluid, it's always changing. Uh, just an example, last week I said that, that I met with city officials, county officials, and they said most likely we won't be gathering until June, mid-June as churches. And then, bam, Governor Reynolds on Monday announces churches can regather. So, so what happened this week was, was pastors and leaders were talking, what do we do? How do we handle this? And churches are choosing to handle this differently. Some churches are probably meeting today. Uh, we have decided not to meet th for the next three weeks. This is the platform that we're going to be worshiping through. Because we want, we want to care for you. We want to make sure everyone is safe during this time. And so that's what we've decided to handle it with. How to handle it. But, but it's hard. It's hard to know how. And the reality is, is this isn't just new to us. This is life. Life is constantly presenting new things. It's not just COVID-19. COVID-19 is just one new situation. But we face multiple new situations all the time. Right? Well, one example is, is maybe some of you are entering a new job. Or you will be soon. You're graduating from college and, and you're looking for employment and you may be entering a new job. That, that may be really hard to figure out how to handle, like your new coworkers and the position itself. Some of you are now facing no job, right? Unemployment, there's over 30 million Americans who are unemployed right now. Some of you are. How do you handle that? This is what Paul's wrestling with with Timothy. Timothy, you are a, a preacher of the gospel just like I am. And, and I'm in prison suffering persecution because of it. You're not suffering persecution yet, but he's inviting Timothy to join him. You're going to enter a new situation. And Paul's concern is, how are you going to handle it? I'm your spiritual father. How are you going to handle it? And what I love is Paul doesn't write a 12-step book on how to do it. How to handle suffering for dummies. Like that's not what he does. Because he knows that life in general is a bunch of new situations. 
And so his heart is how do you handle not the situation? How do you handle yourself in the situation? That's what he presses into. So let's, let's dive in. Verse 1. You then, my child. That's a love word. It's a term of endearment. Be strengthened. Because you are or you will be weakened. That's what persecution does. It attacks you physically to affect you emotionally, mentally, and also spiritually. You're going to need strength, but not by your power, not by your will. In fact, be strengthened. That's a passive, not an active. Be strengthened by the grace of Christ Jesus. This is what he's saying. Put yourself in to the hands of grace. John Piper puts it this way. Uh, We often think of grace as pardoning. It pardons us from an eternal death sentence because of sin. We also got to think of grace, and this is what Paul's pressing into, as empowering. It empowers us to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. And this is the life, verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In trust. We've heard that word. If you weren't with us last week, go back to that message. It's found in chapter 1, verse 12 and 14. Paul says in verse 12, God is guarding what he's entrusted to me. That's the gospel. Verse 14 is Paul telling Timothy that when you step into the heart, be on your guard. Guard the gospel that's been entrusted to you. Firmly and faithfully grip it. But he's now pressing into this. Don't just grip it. Give it. We are not gospel hoarders. We are not quarantining ourselves with the gospel just for ourselves. That's not the life of a disciple. A disciple is one who multiplies disciples. And so give it. Just like I am now giving it to you, Timothy. So Paul and Timothy, that's that's two people, that's two groups, that's two generations. And so Timothy, now you've got to entrust it to others. That's the third group, that's the third generation, who will then, he says, entrust it to others. That's the fourth group, that's the fourth generation. This, This is what I love. He's telling Timothy, be a legacy builder. Legacy is all about what you give. And so my question for you right now is what are you giving people? The temptation is we always want to give them the American dream. We want to give our kids the American dream. We we want them to have money. We want them to have comfort. We want them to have success. We want them to have community. But this is what COVID-19 is teaching us. None of that is stable. None of it. Money is not stable. You you could go on unemployment. Your your investments may go down. Comfort is not stable. Social distancing is not comfortable. It's quite awkward when you meet people on the sidewalk walking. Community is not stable. This is threatening life. It's, It's threatening communities that we love. The only thing that's stable is the gospel. It is what we need to give. It's what we need to entrust people. This is our calling. And we have the power by grace to do it. And when we do it, we're going to suffer through it. That's what Paul says. He says in verse 3, share in suffering. Join me in suffering. It's the same as in chapter 1, verse 8. Endure hardship with me. And this is what sharing in the suffering looks like. He gives us three examples. He gives us a soldier, he gives us an athlete, and he gives us a farmer in verses 3 through 6. Now, let's just think about those a little bit. Um, All three of those are very different, but they all have similarities. And one similarity is they all have goals, 
right? A, a, a soldier's goal is to win victory in battle. An athlete's goal is to win victory in competition, to, as he says, have a crown placed on his head. Or this would be having a gold medallion around your neck at the Olympics. A farmer's goal is a crop, is a harvest. They all have goals, but they all have obstacles, right? A soldier's obstacle is obvious. It's the enemy army. An athlete's obstacle is the competitors. And some of you may be like, no, no you, in, in athletics, you need to compete against yourself. Uh, like, like if you have people competing for the gold, they're your obstacle. Whether that's a triathlon or whether that's monopoly. Whether it's a person you don't know or if it's a spouse or kids, like game on. I am here to crush you. I, I'm not competitive at all, if you can't tell. Um, a farmer's obstacle is the ground, is the weather. There's obstacles, which means to get to the goal through the obstacle, it takes effort. And this is Paul's main point with these examples. Like a soldier's effort is focused. That's what he's talking about. That a soldier cannot get caught up in civilian affairs. They need to focus in on the mission that their commanding officer gives. An athlete, he, he talks about rules. This is the effort. You got to know the rules, but you got to play according to the rules. Meaning there's no easy way out. You don't cheat. You don't, you don't take steroids to get around the rules. You train. You work hard. And then the farmer. Paul just throws a, an adjective to it. Hardworking. You got to labor to be a farmer. You got to work morning, day, night to be a farmer. It takes effort. They have to fight, fight, fight. And so does a disciple. That's Paul's point. He's preparing Timothy for suffering. See, I think, I think too often we think being a disciple, being in the church is just more like a slide. Like that, that slide at the Iowa State Fair, you know what I'm talking about? You hop on a burlap sack and you wee. You just ride down to heaven. Like, that's how often sometimes people treat being a Christian. Paul's saying, don't do that. Because when suffering hits, whatever type of suffering that is, you're going to tap out. Instead of tapping into the power of grace that's found only in Jesus Christ. And so in verse 7, Paul says, think this over, Timothy. I love that. He, he pauses before he goes on. He pauses to say this. Don't read this too quickly. Don't, don't just pass over it and be like, yeah, that's some good analogies there. Um, pretty, pretty good preaching, Paul. Think over. Wrestle with. Is this how you're handling your calling that entails suffering? I'm inviting you to think this over. Are you approaching this? This life of a disciple, life of a Christian, as a slide over against suffering. When COVID-19 hits, when new situations of suffering hits, you're just going to tap out. Like, this is not what I signed up for. You've got to realize this, this isn't what you signed up for. This is what God, by His grace, signed you up for. He signed you up for the greatest good, which is Himself. And it brings suffering. That's, that's why Paul goes on to mention how to handle this in verse 8. He says, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. I love that. It's not because Paul created this gospel. He's received it. It's been entrusted to him, and he is owning it, right? 
for which, verse 9, I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Paul talks about himself, not because, again, he's a guy who likes to talk about himself. That, that's not the type of guy Paul is. He's, this is discipleship. So he's, he's, showing Paul, he's showing Timothy how to live this life of a disciple. How he's doing it is an example. And he's saying, right now, it's not looking good. Right? I'm bound. I can't move. I'm chained. I can't escape. And I'm declared a criminal. I'm a person who can't do anything good, according to people. It's looking really bleak. It's looking like suffering is winning. Sin is winning. Satan's winning. And so remember Jesus, he says. In suffering, in COVID-19, remember Jesus. Remember the cross where he is our soldier, our athlete, our farmer. He went to the cross as our soldier to fight our battle against sin, to win. He went to the cross as an athlete to endure all the hardship of our sin, to be crowned with a crown of suffering, a crown of thorns, so he could hand us a crown of victory. He's our farmer. He's the one who threw the cross, tilled the ground, so that the gospel could be planted in our hearts, so we believe. And the cross, when you look at it, it looks like Satan's winning, sin's winning, suffering's women winning. And so Paul says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, victory, not bound to death. Remember Jesus Christ, offspring of David, meaning go back to 1 Samuel 7, where Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of a conquering king. It looks bleak, but it's not bleak. There's victory in Jesus. It looks bleak for Paul, but it's not bleak because he says this next. The word of God is not bound, Timothy. I'm bound. The word is not bound. I'm chained. The word is not chained. I'm a criminal saying I can't do anything good. The word is not a criminal. It is life-giving. It brings the greatest good, and it cannot be locked down like our nation is right now. That's the reality. And he goes on to say, Therefore, I endure everything, verse 10, for the sake of the elect, that they also may attain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I don't do this for myself. I do it to entrust the gospel to people that they may experience the greatest good. Uh, to, to quote the, the theologians Metallica, never thought I'd do that, huh? Um, nothing else matters. If COVID-19 is teaching us anything, it's got to be that nothing else matters. Because COVID-19 has put its fingerprint on about every aspect of our life, except Jesus Christ, except the glorious gospel of his word. We need Jesus. We have always needed him. The need is not intensified, but this new situation intensifies us to see our need. To see our need to entrust this gospel to others so they can grip it firmly and faithfully. Paul says, that's what I'm doing. My situation's not certain. But the word going out is, just like the God of that word is. That's verses 11 through 13. I'm not going to dive hard into these. This is what it's saying pretty much. God will follow through on his promise. And I think that's why Paul uses the word elect in verse 10. He, he could have said, this is biblical language, he could have said um, that I do this to save the lost. He doesn't use that word. He uses elect. And I know some of you may not like that word. It means that God chooses us. We, we believe that that's biblical. God chooses. This is why. Because he is the first mover of our salvation. We cannot do anything apart from him beginning a salvation process for us. We can't be saved apart from Jesus Christ. 
And the one who begins the good work of salvation will see it through to completion. That's these verses. If we die with him, we'll live with him. Count on that. If we continue to endure Timothy, we will reign with him. Count on that. That's his promise. He's going to see that through. Now, now we like those. We don't really like the next one. If we deny him, he'll deny us. The point is he's consistent. The point is he holds to his promise that salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. You can't deny Jesus and think, well, God, I'm a good person. We are only good when we turn to the one who is good and we rely on him for our salvation. And if we are faithless, he is faithful. That doesn't mean we can be faithless. What it means is God is always faithful. We we change. God never does. And that's why he ends by saying he does not deny himself. He will follow through on his promise because of his dependable character. And we are called to follow him through new situations of suffering. And so how? How do we do that? It is all about not handling the situation. Because we can't. We're so limited. But handling ourselves, handling the word, which shapes us. So so I'm going to put on you two challenges through this message that I think come from this passage. First of all, I want you to to lift the weights today of God's word. I don't don't want you to go from this service just being like, oh, that was pretty good. Like on Facebook. I'm inviting you to think this over. Is this word shaping me? Is it, in a sense, in a positive way, manhandling me to create the greater good of the gospel in and through me? That's what I want you to ask. I want you to evaluate. I want you to press into that. Spend time today thinking this over. Am I approaching the disciple life more like a slide than a soldier? Am I tapping out of the power, out of suffering? Or am I tapping into the power, stepping into suffering? I want to share with you a quote from from C.S. Lewis. It's it's one that came out, uh, was spoken of a lot during the introductory time of COVID-19. He's talking about his time and day and age, which is the atomic age. But this is what he says. He asked the question, how are we to live in an atomic age? How are we to handle it? How are we to handle ourselves? He says, I'm tempted to reply, why as you have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year? Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night? Or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railroad accidents, an age of motor accidents. We could add an age of losing your job, an age of losing a loved one. How do we live? We live with consistency, pressing into who we are as disciples and the situation does not shift or change who we are, even though the situation changes and shifts. And the way we root ourselves in that is through the word. So press into that word, handle it today, apart from this service. The second thing that I want to challenge, the weight I want to put put on us is this. Will you hand the word? Will you entrust the word to someone? Again, think this over. How have you been approaching it? Have you just been hoarding it? Have you been quarantining it to yourself? Look at the people that you're sitting with right now. 
Or if you're alone, think of the people that are on your Zoom meetings or that are at your workplace. How are you entrusting the gospel to them to create a gospel legacy because nothing else matters? One question that I'm I'm asking myself a lot is what am I learning through COVID-19? And it is not a 12-step process of how to handle this. I'm learning a lot about who my God is and who I am and who he's making me to be. Who he's making me to be in community with you. I invite you to do the same and I want to pray that for us. Will you join me? Gracious God and Father, as we are experiencing this new situation, we know we're going to experience more new situations whether caused by COVID-19 or caused just by life. And I pray, Lord, that you will press us into your word today. That first, if we just think that, that the Christian life is a slide, we are definitely not tapping well into the grace of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you'll open our eyes to that and allow us to see the glory and greatness of Jesus and how nothing else matters. So that, Lord, today we make a commitment very clearly to the only one who matters. That we will serve him. I also ask, Lord, that you'll give us your spirit, the spirit of power to entrust this gospel to people. There are so many people wondering what's going on and why it's happening and where is God? Where are you? And you're here. And I pray that you will clearly be seen here through us and entrusting the people what really matters. Accomplish much through us, Lord. We are limited. We are bound in ways, but you and your word is not. Gain victory, we pray today, in Jesus' name, over our life, over the life of many others. Amen. We're going to close out like we have been with some next steps. And I'm going to ask you, don't tap out yet. Okay, we really want you to apply verse 7, which is to think over these words. What does it mean? Not just, hey, we like it. Heart onto Facebook Live. Um, What does it mean? And how are you being shaped? So take time to do that as a family or if you're alone in a journal. And then close that time out with prayer. And so thank you for being here with us as we continue in our worship. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you. May he be gracious to you. And during this new situation, may he give you his peace. Amen.